Um, so I know that just before this, you had an applications of SANS one, on kind of more the hard matter applications of SANS. Uh, and here now we'll be talking, we were taking a completely different approach towards the soft matter and life sciences type examples. So with that in mind, um, there's a couple of different ways uh, we can of course present this and present this type of slide. So I've chosen to do every three or four different kind of um, case studies in a little bit more detail covering, I think the range of the soft matter biomaterials type subjects that you might expect to study. Or right, that might be a good idea to study with SANS and to just give you an idea of kind of some of the techniques that are out there. So that in mind, uh, of course, we all know what the life sciences and the biological materials are, and we tend to put everything under the big umbrella of soft matter. So soft matter being materials that have properties between that of liquids and solids. This includes a range of materials from biological materials, such as your cells, your proteins, your virus capsids, et cetera, et cetera, to your polymers, your polymers, are, to your polymers in inkjet printing. We're interested in potentially how the structure of the polymer change, change, change excuse me, uh, as they go through the inkjet funnel and then how the polymer materials dry when the solvent leaves, what happens to the structure? Is it brittle? Is it flexible, et cetera, et cetera? That's all um, linked to interest in the structure or colloidal suspension, such as your kind of your casein um, aggregates in your milk or your yogurts or your cheeses to your foams, such as uh, the foam in a beer or in a soap and how that affects its part properties, how stable it is. Um, and then, of course, another example is the liquid crystals. Uh, the most common or the easy to go to example is your list, your liquid crystals that are in your, your um, computer monitors or your old fashioned computer mon monitors, for example. So the first kind of case study I wanted to talk about was using microgels and contrast matching. So this is uh, just to get a little bit background of what microgels and microgels are. Um, well, as you can see here, they're an excellent model system. So what does this mean? Well, in about, uh, I think it was 1986, uh, Pussy and Van Megan uh, did one of kind of the, the pinnacle studies on these different materials. So they had these hard colloids and they found that as they increased the concentration, they could observe with their eyes the kind of the phase transitions that we expect to see at the atomic scale. So from liquid to crystallization to liquid crystals kind of towards precipitation. So these are the type of effects that we expect to see at the atomic scale between different atoms. But this they shown that using these kind of these model uh, colloidal spheres, these hard colloidal spheres, they could visualize these effects in length scales that are easily accessible in the live in the lab rather using light microscope, light scattering and microscopy. Uh, so leading us to use them more as a model system and we can investigate uh, these kind of more atoms and more complex fluids using these model systems. So the microgels that I'm talking about in this particular study, so these are bring in an extra element of softness. So around about the same time that Pussy and Van Megan were doing this kind of the pivotal work in the late 80s, uh, Pelton was synthesizing these first ever microgels. They allowed the, the researchers to introduce a softness into the model system that then involved the other interaction potentials. So molecules just don't hit hard against each other or atoms don't hit hard against each other. They'll have some kind of attractive repulsion interactions that can be better modeled with a softer model system. So there's a polymer network swollen in the solvent. We're changing the temperature, pH pressure. We can affect the solvent quality and thus affect the, the degree of swelling of our microgels. We have cores, which are approximated with hard spheres, polymer shells, which to say decay as Gaussians, as shown here, so hard and then a decay. Uh, yeah, so part of the study that I'm going to talk to you through now uh, for the first third of this presentation uh, is how does the softness affect the phase behavior of these colloids? They've been studied, they've been studied not to death, but they've been studied quite a lot. Uh, and a lot of work has already been done understanding how these microgels behave in concentrated solutions. I should say that these are on the couple of hundred nanometer length scales rather than so more like nanogels and microgels. But so we've been seeing that as we increase the concentration in solution, they can be swell, 
they can interpenetrate, they can deform, they interact with their neighbors and depending on the kind of the molecular makeup of the microgel, they've seen these different interactions. The study here, uh, so this is the normal mixing pot for these polymer microgels. If we take out this cross anchor reagent, we can create these what are essentially super soft microgels. Previously, it was shown that the super soft microgels were shown to crystallize. So you can kind of see at a particular concentration, the zeta essentially refers to the concentration. Uh, at a particular point, we get these little speckles indication indicating that crystals were formed. So the aim of this study I want to tell you about uh, was to see how these soft, super soft microgels responded to crowding. So just a quick note, as I mentioned, the zeta is essentially referring to it's the number of swollen microgels, the number of microgels divided by the volume of the swollen microgels divided by this, the total volume of space occupied by them. Um, but it doesn't really matter. Just remember that the zeta is more or less proportional to uh, the concentration. So this is where we get into a small angle scattering. In this particular case, we started off with a small angle X-ray scattering. So we use this as a tool to have a look at the overall microgel to microgel arrangement, right? So this in effect is our structure factor that you've heard about over the last couple of days. If we look at our 2D scattering images on our left-hand side, we go from lowest concentration from figure A right up to highest concentration of figure I. One thing you might recognize are these isotopic rings. So here we have the ring, it's quite small when our um, microgels are at their lowest concentration, right? So quite small, small rings, obviously in first space, they're further away. As we increase the concentration, it, it makes sense, it's not hard to imagine that our microgels will get closer and closer together. And as such, our rings get bigger and bigger in the in first space. So our rings are getting bigger and bigger. And then what they saw with this sam these samples was there was a sweet spot where at about this kind of middle range, right, 0 0.8, they started to form these little, also these little speckles, uh, these little speckles forming to more crystalline type uh, scattering materials, uh, kind of correlating to what we saw physically whenever we looked at the samples and we can see these speckles. And then again, if we move past this sweet spot in concentration, the rings continue to grow bigger and bigger and bigger as the microgels are continually continuing to pack together. But you'll note at this point, at these higher concentrations, we've now, we've now lost these crystalline type peaks, uh, indi indicating that there's a particular phase transition that happens through this particular concentration range that um, is promoting the crystal formation. So of course, we see these crystalline um, structures. So then we can relate these crystalline, sorry, these uh, crystalline peaks or back peaks, and we can relate these to a crystal lattice. Um, so shown from the examples here from, uh, face centered cubic, hexagonal closed pat, a body centered cubic. For these type of materials, uh, typically they found that uh, hard spheres will form, and cross-link microgels as here, will form FCC or HCC type patterns. As I'm sure you've seen before in the past couple of days, when we have these 2D scattering patterns like shown here, so these X-ray scattering patterns, we can take them. If they're isotropic like this, we can do a radial reduction over the entire detector area. So this being our lowest Q and out here to our highest Q. And we can get the information as shown on the pattern here. What's important to note, and actually I probably should have put a, a more convenient figure in for it, is we've, actually no, uh, no, it's fine. Just essentially we can extract the information from the structure factor. So this being our particle to particle interactions. So whenever we extract our information from the structure factor, and we plot it against our Q range, we can quite clearly see, as we'd expect along these crystal samples, um, these little peaks corresponding. So these peaks uh, represent the crystal lattices, so uh, are proportional to the crystal lattices that we see within our microgels. So for our face centered cubic, the lattice constants uh, that we would expect, if we look at our first one, the second lattice conference, uh, constant that we would expect corresponds to this little bump shown here. Then if we go to our third or our fourth, we, we don't really see anything. So it implies that this order is on quite a, a tight scale. It isn't very long range ordered, but we definitely see this little bump here. Uh, again, comparatively with the slightly different concentration. What's interesting to note though, is that the second peak, 
This second peak doesn't correspond to anything to do with the face center cubic, and it didn't correspond. So between the first and second peak, there was no crystal lattice that would have those type of peaks uh, in that particular ratio, implying that we have this existence of some kind of second crystal lattice. Our second crystal lattice in this case, we were um, various other things pointed towards the formation of body center cubic type structures. This really isn't super important, but we essentially saw the coexistence of these face center cubic and body center cubic type structures. So that's great. We have some indication of what's going on in the, in the micro scale to, mi to micro gel to micro gel arrangement, which is perfect. That's what we can get from very useful information from SACS. But what we're also interested in finding out is what's happening to the micro gels on the individual basis, right? So we want to know whether they're faceting, whether they're changing shape, are they interpenetrating? And this is where the magic of neutrons and small angle neutron scattering comes in. So for sure, uh, Andrew, Adrian, or Elizabeth or Wojciech have talked to you about contrasting and contrast uh, variation studies in the previous talks, but just as a quick recap. So say, for example, we have a core shell particle, we have a core, we have a shell, and we have a solvent, right? So each of those three things will have a different molecular makeup, a different density, and therefore have a different scattering length density. So our neutrons will see the transition between the core, between the shell, and between the solvent. The three different components in this basic example can be a little bit difficult to interpret. So what we can do is by cleverly mixing or matching the scattering length density of our solvent, for example, by mixing H2O and D2O, we can match the, sol the scattering length density of the solvent to that of the shell, isolate, the scattering from just the core. Or if we want to see the shell, of course, we can match the scattering length density of the solvent by mixing in different deuterated and hydrogenated solvents, excuse me, matching that of the core, and we just see the scattering from the shell. So as mentioned previously, this selective deuteration in combination with neutrons allows us to investigate selected parts of complex assemblies. And by combining x-rays and neutrons, we can get even more information. So now let's take a different approach. Now we're not just talking about one particular molecule. Now we want to have a look at how we can deal with this in more complex systems. For example, a system of crowded microgels, um, our microgels in a crowded environment. So for example, we take our first sample, we have our solvent, say for example, DTO, we have all these microgels visible. So this is a load of deuterated particles and a few hydrogenated particles. But other than that, they're the same. The same size, the same density, everything like that's the same. If we look at these deuterated and hydrogenated samples of X-rays, we see as expected. So we see a scattering pattern, so our I of Q on the left-hand side, which is going to be proportional to our form factor, our shape of our individual particles, and our structure factor. So this particle to particle arrangement, as shown here. But now, if we match the solvent, so this, for example, D2O, so if we do a mixture of D2O and H2O to match the scattering length density of the deuterated particles, we render these deuterated particles invisible, and we just isolate the form factor, so the shape of these individual hydrogenated particles. So these hydrogenated particles will have all of the other deuterated particles forcing on them, uh, interacting with them during the interpenetration or changing their shapes, for example, but we don't get the crowded information from the structure factor on top of that. So whenever we measure neutrons on the exact same sample, we just isolate this form factor information of the individual or the, the more dilute hydrogenated microgels. So as you can see, exact same sample, we lose all of this peak information and we can isolate this individual information. This means that we can get from the one sample using x-rays and neutrons, both pieces of information. And then therefore by dividing the SACS data, which is our I of Q proportional to our P of Q and our S of Q by the, the SANS data, so our IQ, which is just proportional to the form factor, we can also then, I don't know why it keeps moving, we can also then isolate our structure factor information, which is exactly what we did to get, oh, excuse me, to get this information here. So this was the SACS data, so our P of Q times I of Q, divided by our SANS data, which was just our I of Q, to isolate the structure factor. So then this is how we can then analyze this data forever. It's a really, really lovely use of using the X-rays and neutrons in combination uh, to get more information from your sample. Uh, and I'd highly recommend trying a similar approach if you have these type of systems.
So moving on. One, the common question when we have these soft matter materials that we're doing selective deuteration uh, of, or we're doing kind of hydrogenation, we're mixing. So of course we can synthesize particles that have um, the required amount of deuterium versus hydro hydrogen uh, for all ranges from right through from bioscience to material science. One question that is always asked is, can, can we really believe that these two materials are the same, right? We know that protons, uh, yeah, hydrogen and deuterium are almost the same, but they're ever so slightly different. So it's always good to have a method to check and confirm to everyone else that your materials are actually comparable. In this case, this is exactly what happened. So they uh, looked at the systems of the protonated samples and the systems of the deuterated samples. They had a look at how they changed their shape as a function of temperature. They saw these phase transitions, so they de-swelled at a almost exactly the same temperature between the two different species. Um, they also change sizes to roughly the same size. This obviously is an ideal. We can see from about 45 to 55 whenever they're de-swollen, but they're close enough for us to be pretty confident that this is a, a, reasonable, a reasonable comparison. We then took a step forward. So we also, Oh, no, we didn't take a step forward, sorry. So another thing, okay, so we have our deuterated samples. One thing that we need to do before we can do the, just measure with the sands is of course we have to identify the scattering length density of our, our, deuterated, our deuterated microgels in order to match them out. So on the left-hand side here, we have, this is maybe a slightly different approach in terms of, I think, probably Adrian showed you the approach of going to the I of zero and working out your scattering, your contrast matching point from that. Um, I also like this approach. So here you have uh, the same concentration of microgels. So of your deuterated microgels in different uh, weight percents of D2O. So obviously you can see at the say 100% H2O and 100% D2O, you have the greatest contrast. And as you start to go towards more of a mixture between the D2O and H2O and get closer to the contrast matching point, you lose the contrast and so the scattering intensity drops off. If you take five different, if you take the value of each intensity at five different uh, Q points along along each of these data, and then you can plot them in the format shown here, where they overlap and cross over the, the zero, so your, your difference in scattering length density and being zero, so your contrast matching point. Um, if you're lucky, they'll all overlap uh, nice and perfectly. And this is our contrast matching point for our deuterated microgels. Of course, then you can pair your samples. So this time, this is uh, each of the samples, so these are mostly deuterated with a few hydrogenated, and then you can measure them with sands. In this particular case, exactly what we did. So we have the increasing overall concentration of the microgels. And in this study, they had a look at how the structure of each individual microgel changed over time. So just for the interest of being complete, they saw in this study that the microgel shells, shells first collapsed. And then as they increase the concentration further, the microgels themselves became more condensed and more compact. And a quick, this then at that point allowed them to perform a comparison between the SANS and the SACS data. So from our SANS data, we acquired the diameter of the individual microgels. And from the SACS data, we could acquire the neighbor to neighbor distance from the position of the first peak. In the red area, they saw that where the radius or the sorry the diameter of the microgels was more or less or sorry the radius of my diameter of the microgels was more or less comparable to the microgel to microgel distance so they're swollen and just touching but not so swollen or so compressed that they're ever further away from each other or they're starting to interpenetrate it was in this sweet spot that they were seeing the formation of these crystalline type samples That was the first study, which essentially I wanted to show you in order to show some of the elegant, or I think at least, some really elegant approaches to using contrast matching and the type of information you can get from even relatively simple systems, such as concentrated solutions of microgels. The next topic I want to tell you about a little bit more, um, as I mentioned yesterday, is rheology sans type experiments. So this is gonna start with a quick overview on what is rheology, just to get everyone on the same page. Um, although I expect everyone in the audience here uh, may already know. 
Um, so first of all, what is rheology? So rheology is the study of flow. So what controls a material's rheological properties? Well, whether that mat the material's inner structure, how is it built, what's its molecular makeup? That material's morphology, what is the shape and size of the components? Do you have needle-like structures, bulky cotton-like structures, etc.? Also, what are the external forces that are acting on the system? Is the system under flow? Is it under a lot of pressure? Is it being stretched or deformed? And finally, what are the ambient conditions? What environment is the stress material in, such as the temperature, the humidity? Um, is it under some kind of light or something like that? Uh, with that in mind, liquids, we can kind of put all materials in the world and the planet into two different groups. We have liquids and we have solids, right? Liquids flow, solids don't, but of course materials are more complex, right? We have materials, viscoelastic, in, in, viscoelastic materials that have some component of viscosity and some component of them that are elastic. Fistoelastic liquids or viscous liquids rather are liquids with an elastic portion that when they're stressed, they flow but exhibit a small amount of uh, a small amount of stiffness. So this is your viscoelastic liquids. And then you have viscoelastic solids that when deformed, not too large, they try and retain their shape. So say for example, you push against a tire, it will, it will change its shape, but it'll push back at you and then oftentimes reform its shape. And then you take that to the next extreme. And of course you have solids, which always retain the same st stiffness um, and don't deform until, of course, they break and become brittle. So this term viscosity has come up, viscosity being the measure of a fluid's resistance to flow by an applied deformation force. Uh, and with this, we can use the viscosity of material to understand the internal friction of that fluid. So for example, here we have honey. It uh, has a high viscosity. It has restriction due to its molecular makeup and morphology leading to internal friction. In contrast, we have water, which flows super easily. It's got a low viscosity and has very little internal friction. Uh, then moving on to the kind of the deformation forces that we can apply to our materials. This is of course true whenever the type of forces that we need to consider when we want to do these experiments. What type of deformation forces can we apply? Well, of course we have tension where we pull from the opposite directions on our material. We have compression where we push in opposite directions in our material. We have bending where we push outside forces, but they're not aligned, right? So it results in bending of the material. We have torsion, for example, if we twist. And the one that I'm gonna focus on for the purposes of the Rio Sand stock is shear. So this is where we have unaligned forces pushing in one direction, like opposite directions to each other, resulting in a shear internally within the material. Just a quick note on uh, viscosity, shear stress and shear rate. So we have, say for example, a tube. We have a material being forced through that tube. The material in the inside, so kind of this middle line, will be flowing more freely than the material in the outside line, which is experiencing friction from the outer walls of the tube. This distance here, so the distance between the middle and the outside shearing plane of the material, uh, we can use this to determine our shear rate. So it's the difference in viscosity between these two levels divided by the distance that gives us our shear rate. We can also measure the force that's applied to get our material through a tube. For example, for honey through a tube is a lot harder. So it makes a lot more force to push it through a tube than for example, water or I don't know, toothpaste. We can then use this to determine our shear stress. So this is the force applied divided by the area to which you're applying that, you need to apply that force to. So important to note that this shear rate is proportional to the shear stress. High shear stress, we can expect a higher shear rate. Higher the viscosity, higher the shear stress required to flow at the same rate of a less viscous listen. So exactly as I said, in order to get honey to move just as fast as to get the water to move, you need to apply a lot more stress to the honey. And viscosity is equal to shear stress over shear rate. So. Some things that we are typically interested in when we do rheology experiments are these flow profiles. So first of all, before I promise you, I'm about to get onto the scattering bit in a minute. Um, so let's consider the different types of flow. First of all, we have Newtonian. So these are Newtonian fluids, as you may know, are fluids that have a viscosity that doesn't change the shear rate. 
So it doesn't matter how high, fast you shear water, its viscosity will stay the same. Non and then the second class of materials are, are non-Newtonian. So first of all, we have our pseudoplastics. These are shear fanning materials. As we shear them, the more and more we shear, we increase the shear rate, they become less and less viscous. For example, mayonnaise is gloopy in the jar. Once you start to spread it, it becomes less viscous. Uh, these type of materials, for example, you can think of them as pseudoplastic and they imagine that you have a plastic that's really wound up and coiled together as you apply force, these coils can start to disentangle. As you apply further force, the chains have disentangled enough that they can slide quite smoothly over each other, resulting in the lower viscosity. We then have our dilatant shear thickening materials. This is where viscosity increases with shear rate. So, for example, quicksand or cornstarch. I think I had a dodgy little video. I did. So you hit cornstarch really hard with a hammer, you get resistance, but if you hit it slowly, it can go in, uh, it can go in quite easily. So this is, there's kind of an explanation for this, whereby whenever you hit something really hard, the energy dissipates super fast in the molecules and they start to organize and form like a resistive structure. Well, if you go slowly, there isn't that massive impact of energy causing all of the atoms to rearrange and you can kind of slice through or, push the hammer through the material. Then we have finally our fixotropic materials. So these are shear finning, like the mayonnaise example, but this time time dependent, such as ketchup, where you give it a shake and then you can pour it, coatings, paints, etc. Just to show you what I think, as you can see here, so we have our shear finning, and then it takes a little time to recover the same viscosity whenever the shear rate drops off. So we have this degree of hysteresis. Talk through, this is, I think, quite a nice example of where these kind of fixotropic materials are important, for example, with paint. So you have a paint, you have it sat in a pot, it's quite viscous, it, well, it's static, but it's quite viscous. You start to stir it, it gets a little less viscous, gets a little easier to apply, you apply it to a wall. What's important is whenever you remove the brush, you want it to not completely go hard and stay in its place. You want it to be fluid, fluid enough that it's able to kind of spread and soften down. So you don't get these kind of paint stroke effects that people typically don't want when they're painting their walls. But also you do need it to dry because you don't want it to stay fluid for so long that when it eventually will just drop off the wall. So getting the combo of this fixotropic properties where we have our shear thinning and then the time dependent recovery is super important whenever they're designing things like paint. And they can control how your paint or your material behaves by tuning its structure relationship, its parts of the material structure to tune its properties. And that's finally when we're getting onto a Rio sands. So it, what we're interested here, uh, or in my world essentially, is in these structure property relationships. So the rheology of a complex fluid is directly related to its structure. We need to understand how a, structure, how a material reorganizes its structure due to flow and then the relationship between the flow and the stretch, which govern the bulk rheological properties of a system. You can see numerous examples on the right hand side here from different entangled polymers for polymer melts, surfactant solutions, they obviously have their structures and then how they behave. Uh, latex paint, whipped cream, mayonnaise, blood plasma. These are all materials that we're very interested in being able to tune their structure in order to tune their, um, the properties that we actually interact with. So as you've seen many times before, for this, we want to use our small angle scattering technique to probe the structure of these substances from the nanometer to a couple of uh, 100 nanometer length scales. This is ever so slightly more or less the slide I showed you yesterday. So this Rio Sands is an excellent tool to help us understand this structural reorganization as a result of flow. And in this study, although I mentioned yesterday there are numerous shear cell examples, we're gonna focus in on the cuet cell where we have a cup, we have a bob, the inside cup can spin and shear and add deform deformation forces to the sample that's in this gap in between. So, Again, I briefly mentioned yesterday about the planes of interest, whether it be this radial plane going directly through the cup. So this is our neutron beam going directly through the cup, our tangential or our one, two shear plane, which is, as I said, slightly more difficult to prove. But each 
plane offers specific and unique information for describing these structured property relationships. So what do I mean by that? It's quite handy. There's a, this is an example from Norman Wagner's group in the States. But I think the best way to think about this for me is imagining you've got spaghetti in a pot, long chains of pasta, and you stir them, right? You create a sort of pseudo vortex. The pasta chains start to line up on the outside of the pan, right? This is kind of what's happening here. So we have our cup, our ball rubber that's spinning on the inside. We have a cup on the outside and we may have, so in here it's kind of long blobs, but you have long chains or anything that has some kind of anisotropic structure. They are encouraged to align as you're doing the shearing. What I want to exemplify here is the different information that you might get, at least pictorially, from these different uh, planes of interest. So for example, if we look at a one free plane, so this is our pointing directly through the middle of our shear cell, we can see the, the kind of the side for you. So as shown here in the sketch of these um, particles, if we look at the two free planes, so this is now going along the side of the bob, so this tangential version sketch shown here, we now see with our scanning pattern, the cross section of these particles. So here, for example, if it was some kind of cylindrical blob, it would be the spherical ring as a side view. You can see quite clearly from the scattering patterns, the difference in the type of information that you'll get from the two frames of perspective. As I mentioned, it's particularly hard when neutrons and x-rays to use the, we, we can't use the Anton Parr rheometer that I showed previously to look at this, uh, field of vision. So looking down, you have to design special cells for these. But whenever you do use one of these special cells, known as a one two shear cell, you'll also get a different field of vision. Again, you have a different orientation of your particles. And say, for example, you have big long chains of spaghetti, you'd expect them to bend following the curvature of your of your cell. And that's what you should see this kind of anisotropy uh, from this top view. So you can kind of see it's not completely symmetrical in comparison to how uh, this image here is. So all three fields of vision gives you really important information about what you can see inside your sample. So with that in mind, uh, I haven't got one particular example to show you. I kind of just wanted to give an impression of, of like the multitude of different types of materials that can be measured during this technique. One of them, uh, one of the more famous um, neutron scattering experiments for RioSans is by the group again of Norman Wagner in the States. Uh, and he was studying the ballistic impact of say a bullet hitting Kevlar woven, plast woven materials, the Kevlar, the super resistant, super strong body armor type material when it was impregnated. So loaded with colloidal shear thickening fluids. So these shear thickening fluids are the ones I said before, you have a big impact, they reorganize, become super stiff and super resistant. But imagine if you're, you're moving quite slowly, you hit them slowly, they're softer, more easy to wear. It's of course ideal. So you can actually, I should show you the data first. You can see it here that we have our viscosity on this side and our shear, our viscosity drops off massively with increasing shear. This and that due to the structure of the colloidal particles, uh, embedded into the material. What I love about this application is if you can imagine with your Kevlar suit, you want to wear it for protection, but in your day to day, you're walking around, you want it to be smooth, soft, right? So you're moving slowly, you're not doing any base impact. It's soft, it's smooth, it moves with you. Whenever you, uh, that's ideal for something that you're wearing. Once you get hit with a bullet, of course you want it to work and go super, super stiff. So it seems like the perfect application for this type of material. Another example is for materials for using, investigating materials used for polymer solar cells. As I mentioned in the very first slide, we're often interested in how materials behave under processing, which is where rheology can oftentimes come into it, because often things are a injecting, inject, jetted, ingest, probably the wrong word, printed through a fine nozzle. They undergo shearing and that kind of very typically in manufacturing processes. So this is um, an ideal application here. And here they used, they studied the structural properties of polythiophene, so the uh, light absorbing polymer for organophotophotics. And they studied, so these materials were loaded into gels and they studied the gelation process with the rheology. So as the if something's gelating, obviously it's viscosity, but turning into a gel, its viscosity is gonna change over time. Um, so we can 
kind of investigate that with rheology, at the same time measured the structure directly with the sands. So the sands showed that the structural features evolved through the gelation project uh, process, which could be controlled by either redissolving the polymer gel or changing the solvent. Uh, and the final Rio Sands example I wanted to show you, it's kind of following on from one of the questions yesterday. Um, this is definitely not exactly it, but this is, we can always take our sample environments a step further. So while these rheology sands um, setups are quite ubiquitous in all, all of the institutes, there's always room for further improvements. So this is a lovely example where they had these um, dielectric sensitive worm like micelles left and they had that they found that they were branched worm like micelles of this material. And as so they could transport charge because the different charge groups and stuff on them, but it was the level of conductivity was super highly related to the amount of branching. And they found that as they sheared, the branches would split apart, they'd become more linear, and therefore the conductivity would drop off. And the way that they could see this was by doing in situ rheology with in situ impedance spectroscopy, so they could measure the charge moving across the material as they were shearing it, at the same time as measuring the small angle scattering, so investigating the structure at the same time. So as I said, uh, branch uh, warm up micelles showed fast breakage time, so they broke apart, unbranched micelles, whenever they also compared with just originally linear uh, worm like micelles, these are long chains of um, surfactants, they found that as they were shearing them, their, um, their electrical properties didn't really change because there was nothing to break apart. Okay, so the very last kind of group of samples I want to tell you about, or the final little kind of study I wanted to tell you about was an example based on proteins. Um, I should say as a caveat, I've chosen an example that was led by Adrian Sanchez Fernandez, one of the other speakers on this course. So please feel free to ask me any questions at the end, but or whenever you want. But um, the thank you particularly interested in, I would encourage you to chase them up. This all work forms a part of a next bioform collaboration within Sweden for formulation and processing of biologics. So in this particular study, uh, Adrian was interested in looking at how proteins and surfactants behaved in formulated products. So I don't know if you know, but when you have a protein such as, for example, human growth hormone that needs to be uh, medicated to someone's solution as someone, I don't know, in a medical type environment, it, it's obviously in a solution. The proteins typically undergo different aggregation processes as soon as they're left for a little while they can become destable or fall out of solution etc cetera, etc cetera. and one way to overcome and to make these materials more stable and to last longer is to add in surfactants so they surfactants are known to play an important role in the stability and, and performance of formulated products the goal of this study say our goal the goal of this study was to develop this interrogative, interrogative approach to understand the conformation and colloidal stability of protein surfactant systems. So I'm not going to focus on all of the other characterization techniques, but what I will tell you about specifically is the contrast variation small angle neutron scattering studies that they performed and a very little bit about the constrained model fitting that they did. So in this scenario, they put, took their um, protein, which was their human growth hormone, as shown here, or the crystal shown structure phone shown here, and the anionic surfactant SDS, sodium dodecyl sulfate. They formed these uh, small angle neutron scattering measurements with contrast variation. Well, it's interesting here. So if we take our two different spheres, we have one of these spheres is a protein. Uh, one of these spheres is our surfactant. And uh, they arranged it so they had these four different isotopic mixtures that we used to, by tuning four different isotopic mixtures, whether that be matching out the protein and surfactant to each other, matching the protein to the solvent, matching the surfactant to the solvent, or using the zero average contrast condition that might have already come up, they could probe different elements of the aggregate altogether. So unlike where for the first example I was showing you with the microgels, whereby they were trying to isolate the overall structure, in this time they're trying to probe different particular parts of the aggregates of the atomic aggregates. So they use these four different structure, four different isotopic uh, mixtures to follow the structural changes occurred 
uh, with the system as they added an increasing concentrations of SDS. Uh, each of these contracts, uh, contrasts used a specific isotopic labeling to focus on a particular feature of the system. So as you can see, there, when we have our surfactant and our solvent matched, we should isolate the structure of the protein backbone by itself. When we have our protein and surfactant matched, we should isolate the structure of the complex. When we have the protein solvent matched, we should isolate the structure of the surfactant. Now this, uh, the SAT condition, this is our zero average contrast condition. This uses, uh, this essentially, we, when we have our mixture of our, Okay, okay, I'm trying to think of a better way to explain it. The formation of complex, if we form a complex between our protein and our surfactant, we will either lead to essentially no effective forward scattering because the contrast match conditioning is achieved. But say for, so if the surfactant is uniformly spread all over the protein, we should see no scattering, as in a flat line here, there is no scattering effect. But if segregation of compounds occur within the complex, for example, if our surfactant is becoming aggregated in clusters along our protein, then we should see a broad peak appear from the density correlation between these complex domains. So essentially, we'll get little aggregates of the surfactant on top of our protein, which will then start to interact with each other, and we should get some kind of scattering condition um, from that. The zero average contrast condition is, for me anyway, quite a complicated. Um, yeah, it's quite a difficult condition to try and achieve with normal experiments, but when it works, it can be incredibly useful, as it did for Adrian here. So first of all, of course, we had to measure, or they had to measure the, the, the bare protein by itself, so they had something to work on. Uh, so they started with the structural characterization of their human growth hormone. So this is the, uh, their scattering data, so the human growth hormone is a small globular protein, which it is built up of four anti-parallel alpha helixes. In brief, so uh, they use the pair distribution function, was initially determined for the IFT approach. This is all stuff that uh, Wojciech, I think, will far um, better describe to you. Uh, but they also took the crystal structure of the protein and used this using the Chrysan software to also try and fit. In all honesty, um, the, the details are quite complex and I'll probably refer to your paper. Um, but in essence, we have a globular protein, which has a diameter, a maximum diameter of about 52 Armstrongs, a radius of gyration by 18 Armstrongs. Uh, it, it behaved as a monitoring solution. So one of the concerns with this project was that it was starting off aggregated and as a contrast matching point, of about 60% uh, HGO. So then he found with his contrast variation and his SANS measurements, they could study the changes in structure and interactions between the complexes. They had uh, various phases of the interactions, so various complexation phases, so whether it be a pre-critical -aggreg aggregation phase where the protein was essentially untouched. I think I have a better figure here where SDS was being absorbed onto the surface of the micelle and you got subtle conformational changes of the protein. Then as they added more SDS, the protein became more and more unfolded as it was absorbing more and more surfactant. Then got this clustering, um, as I mentioned, from they could see from the SAC approach. So the SAC approach shown here, kind of have to stretch to see it, but there was in comparison from left to right, the second which you can start to see the formation of some some kind of uh, some kind of intensity, implying that we get this STS clustering and these clusters are starting to interact with each other. And then finally leading to this final stage, this post CMC stage, where you have a decorated micelle morphology. So here we have a completely disrupted disrupt, disrupted uh, protein structure that's completely mixed in with an SDS micelle. So obviously in the process of deciding what concentrations of surfactants do to stabilize, this is something of interest to us because we have to understand what our surfactant is doing to the protein. Uh, Adrian did this lovely sketch for his paper to show uh, how the protein changed with increasing concentrations of SDS. They also compared these studies with some NMR, 
NMR study. So the SANS was used to probe the tertiary structure of the protein, and then it was complemented with the NMR to probe the secondary structure of the protein. So with that in mind, uh, I didn't for some reason put a conclusion slide in or a summary slide, uh, but that's all I had to talk to you about in terms of examples with using applications for soft matter and biological type applications of SANS. Um, if anyone has any questions, please shout them out. I'm sorry, that was a bit of a rapid case for a couple of examples, but I hope it was useful. Does anyone have any questions? No one? Um, as, as others have said, I will, of course, put these slides online uh, with everybody else's. And I think, I don't know if you've been sent the link already or you'll be sent the link so you can access them all. Uh, and of course, be around tomorrow for the uh, lab sessions and then the presentations on Friday. But if that is all, uh, we can leave it there.